there's only two ways this is going to end. This is especially with the drugs. I just remember thinking that there's only two ways this is going to end, and that's going to be jail or I'm going to die. How are you? And thanks for being here. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 756, with my guest today, Maddie Madison. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, the founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is to support traditional martial artists and the traditional martial arts. Want to know what that means? Go to whistlekick.com. If it's your first time or you haven't been there in a while, you should probably check it out because we're constantly adding things because we're constantly looking for new ways to support. One of the things we've got there, it's our store. We sell an ever-changing selection of apparel and training programs and what else is over there? Events. So much good stuff. Use the code PODCAST15 to get 15% off just about anything that we sell. Now the website for this show is actually different. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Two episodes each and every week with the goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists everywhere. If you want to help the show and help the martial arts community by extension, well, you can do a bunch of stuff. You could grab a book. You could tell a friend about us. Leave a review somewhere. Maybe join the Patreon. If you think new shows are worth 63 cents, you could join the Patreon at $5 a month. And we're also going to give you bonus episodes and you can participate in live hangouts. There's so much other stuff going on over there that $5, it's a bargain. Please consider it. But if you want the full list, if you want to go deeper than that, maybe you're already a Patreon contributor. And if you are, thank you so much for doing so. We've got the whistlekick.com family page. You got to type it in. It's not linked. And we do that because we figure if you're willing to take that little hurdle, you deserve the stuff on the other side. Thank you to those of you who check that out. We change it weekly. I had a great conversation with Maddie. We talked about these two sort of distinct times in her life where martial arts played a role and how the second time was very intentional. I'm not going to give anything away. There's some power in these stories here. I hope you enjoy them. Hey, Maddie, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy to have you here. We were just talking. You know what you're in for. You've listened to the show. And that makes my job so much easier. Wow. I, don't have to, uh, I don't have to convince you that we're on the same side. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Right? I don't know if you listen to other podcasts, but sometimes they're not on the same side. Yeah, I, I actually listen to uh, a lot of your podcasts. It's usually how I, uh, either where I'm taking a bath or right before I'm going to sleep. <laughs> there you go. We, we People listen to this show in so many different ways and for so many different reasons. And that's honestly one of my favorite things. It's not one thing to one group of people. It's a bunch of different things to a bunch of groups of people. And Absolutely. I think that's that's cool. Uh, as with any episode, we're going to wander. We're going to talk about different things over periods of time. You know where I like to start. I like to start at the beginning most of the time. So what's what is the beginning of your martial arts journey look like? Well, gosh, it goes back to the mid to early 60s. <laughs> wow. Okay. And again, I hate to age myself, but you know, that's what it is. And I just have always had an interest. I wasn't mm -hmm. say bullied. It wasn't, you know, it didn't drive me because I was being bullied and I, you know, wanted self-defense. I just thought, wow, this is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I uh, bought several books, which books were very rare back then. And I actually didn't get a chance to take my first class till 1967. And actually I looked at the I looked at my old membership card. It was in February of 67. You still have it. I still have it. Right oh, that's here. cool. And, uh, and, of course, it was a Shotokan. And uh, the sensei was fresh from the instructor's um, training in Japan. Mm. And I know a lot of people nowadays, they don't like to hear about, wow, it was so different. And, you know, it was tougher, and blah, blah, blah many years ago, and all I'll say is, it was different. <laughs> 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 At least what I was exposed to. Sure. I am still training, so yeah. uh, I've 
have taken five styles since then. Okay. So I've had some somewhat of a a, a look at. Yeah, I've I've uh, trained in Montana and Pennsylvania and down in Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I I do have had a look at different styles and what yeah. they offer, and they're all great. Of course, they're. I mean, I think they are. They're they all exist for a reason. Absolutely. And that's that's where I go. I want to go back though. In the early 60s, as you said, there wasn't a lot of martial arts. There wasn't even a lot of books. So I'm curious, how did you get exposed to martial arts in such a way that you were so strongly interested you wanted to go buy books? I'm just yeah, I can't really answer that because I don't mm. know. I mean, I was just aware of it and I just was super intrigued about it. Mm. And I think I can remember the first book I bought, I believe was, and I'm going to really butcher his name. Okay. Uh, Mas Oma? The- Masoyama. Masoyama. Yeah. And of course, good God, he's dropping bulls. It's like, <laughs> who doesn't want to drop a bull? <laughs> uh, I believe that was the first one. Um and then, yeah, I don't remember afterwards, but I'm That's looking okay. up a show if I've got about 20 some books here. Yeah. I still like to read stories, uh, autobiographies, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the uh, quote famous people that I was able to train with for two years was, was Cynthia Jim Harrison up in mm-hmm. Montana. Yeah. Uh, he was the only non traditional Japanese, even though you know, he claimed that you know that we were doing an open island style we didn't concentrate much on on forms jim harrison was all always all, all about fighting <laughs> but jim was a uh he, he was a pretty neat guy um i i was sad to find out a few years ago that he had passed away mm-hmm. every once in a while i do look up the see where my old senses you know are and, uh you know, that, that was quite an experience with him. <laughs> mm, yeah. How much do you remember about that time, February of 67, in your, your first classes? I remember, well, like some of the exercises we did, you know, you would trade punches to people in the billy and you, you'd get a pink billy. I mean, yeah. they, they were good. They were good slaps. I can remember doing squats with another uh, student on your on your back on your shoulders and doing mm-hmm. squats, you know that that kind of stuff. Um, very very disciplined, of course. Mm-hmm. And I don't think my well, sensei then his name was uh, Jim Ambrose from uh, the Wyoming Valley Karate Club in Pennsylvania. And last I looked, he's still alive and well. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Uh, yeah, it, it it was it was quite different, and this is before what I refer to as the big Shotokan splits. Yeah, you know when they split and then they split and they split. And good gosh, there's so many different splits now. But Shotokan is just it amazes me. But this is the old uh, JKA, and again, uh, I believe if history serves me well, that uh, Japan sent you know several different instructors to different people and filtered. Mm-hmm. The United States, and uh, the only other one I think in Pennsylvania was down in Pen- or was down in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was fun. Uh, I won't say brutal, brutal, but um, it was tough. It was they, they if they did it nowadays, you'd have a lot more dropouts. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've I've talked to people who've talked about that time. You know, I, I wasn't around then, but I came up in the early 80s and there were still uh, some shadows of that time. And what I've heard people say about the 60s specifically is a lot of instructors prided themselves on a high dropout rate of putting together classes so brutal that people couldn't handle it. So you'd have these schools with, you know, eight students. Well, we, I think we, we averaged... 10 or 15 at all times. There's a dropout rate, but also because it was new. Sure. It was new to that area. You know, we had a lot of people come in. And of course, you know, 
martial arts in general still has a pretty high dropout rate, rate I think. Yeah. Um, I ended up, uh, oh, a few years ago, uh, it was actually an honor. I can remember after class one time, my sensei, and this is, uh, this is Waddle Pai I was taking. I, mm-hmm. I spent eight, nine years with this guy. One day after class, and he, he was Japanese, so, and I say that because um, he was short on words. <laughs> and after class, he just looks over me and says, do you like kids? And I was like, well, that's an unusual question. He says, of course I like kids. <laughs> and I think the next question, or the next thing out of his mouth was, be at this school. And I ended up working for him for four years. Uh, three different schools, three times a week. Teaching kids classes. Teaching kids classes. Uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't ask you if you wanted to do it. He just he asked told if you... He to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and it, uh, it turned out to be just one of the biggest joys. Hmm. I mean, the first few months, it was, it was hard because he wanted it done, of course, his way. Sure. And I don't always follow the rules i mean I'm, I'm I'm a little more friendly and a little more lenient i mean i can remember it, if kids were to, to to mess up he'd make a duck walk around a, the gymnasium mm-hmm. but i would feel sorry for him and and says, you don't have to do that <laughs> you have to three or four laps because they'd be crying right um but i had a ball doing that and of course all i taught was taekwondo uh, taiko ku I probably mm. bet thousands and thousands of times. Very, very few of them ever uh, got past because it was only you know these were middle school kids right. uh, would would graduate to a pianita. Yep. But uh, I just had a ball doing that. I just looked so forward to it. Mm. And it was three different schools up here. You know, I live up in the mountains. My mm. house is at seven thousand feet. Mm. Our dojo was at nine thousand, and if Anybody hasn't been exposed to altitude training at 9,000 feet is um, oh, sure, yeah, that's challenging by itself, also for sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I loved it. Then it went to oh, after about a year, he would call me oh, maybe every third time when we were having our classes, he would call me early and say, Would you come in early? And mm. he would have me work with the kids at the dojo. And that went to after two years where I I basically did the, the new kids, not the older kids mm-hmm. that had been there. Uh, I did the kid, kids classes at the dojo. And that went to when he would go, to, my sensei, when he would go to Japan or wherever for his seminars, which to me, it was an honor, you know, that he yeah. would give me the, give me the kids classes. So, yeah, I enjoyed that. And I did that up until um, I had two heart attacks a few years ago oh. and, you know, had a stent and, you know, yada, yada. And my stamina was just almost down to zero. Hmm. I, mean, I would, you know, and then I, I thought it was out of two, but it wasn't. It, you know, I've got heart disease. and That is what it is. Um but one day I was working with one of the kids, and, and this this kid was, I'm guessing, about 14 or so years old. And I would do a cuddle with him, and I'd do it two, three times, and then I'd have to bow out, leave the mat, mm-hmm. just sit on the sideline, recollect myself, go back in, go back. And he, after class, he just looked at me and said, I think you came back too soon. And that was right before, well, that's about six months or so excuse me, before the COVID hit. Mm. So then I was, you know, I wasn't doing anything for, I don't know, about a year or so. This room here in the background is a is a spare bedroom. Mm-hmm. And I decided, you know, once again, I, I've got to do something, especially in the wintertime out here in Colorado. Um, I've got to do something. Yeah. And, uh, so I turned it into my little dojo. And I you know, would practice my katas. And uh, then I learned about Zoom. Before that, I couldn't spell Zoom. <laughs> and uh, I trained three days a week. I trained uh, 
with a group uh, from the Indiana University. Mm -hmm. and they're mostly Shotokan people, which is fine. And I train another time with a, uh, a group from uh, Southern Utah. Mm -hmm. And then I train with a, 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 another friend from uh, Indiana. And we do we do basics, but basically it's it's doing kata. And I have learned so much. I love Zoom. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I, I, I will say one of the best things to come out of the last few years is that everybody knows about Zoom. A lot of the barriers around distance training or online training or whatever you want to call it have have uh if not broken down completely fractured and then from our very selfish standpoint we don't have to tell people what zoom is because if audience in case you don't know this is how we conduct almost all of our episodes is over zoom so you knew what it was we didn't have to explain to you what it was and that that makes our job easier well, i like training and again it's uh they know me well enough now where they they refer to it the, the one guy I trade would, I think you've hit the wall because my stamina sucks. Mm. Um, you know, my heart's good. I mean, my wanting to do it. Sure. But, you know, if I do, um, oh, she, you know, she'll have me do katas like, for instance, Kushanku or, or, or Naihachi. After about seven or eight times, then I start screwing up. And I mean, I'll forget moves, moves that I know. And mm -hmm. that's what you say, well, I think you're hitting the wall. And of course, she's, she's right. It took her a while to, to recognize that. Uh, and is know. that getting better as time goes oh, on? No. no. It'll never, it'll never no. get better. Oh, wow. Fascinating. It'll never. Actually, when I, when I found out I um, had heart problems, I had just gotten, I've got two German Shepherds. Mm. And interesting enough, one of them is named Waddle, and the other one is named Kai. <laughs> Great names. Great names. Um, and the one is an import. Actually, uh, he has a passport. Oh. I, got him, I got him from Europe, had him shipped over. Mm -hmm. And the first year I had him, I went to go see my sister in, uh, in Ohio. And her house, I looked it up, the elevation is like 240 feet. And I remember thinking, because I was, I was what I call sucking air, you know, around that time. And I kept thinking, well, geez, you know, when I go to Ohio, I'm just going to, I'm going to breathe. I'm going to have all this energy and mm -hmm. yada, yada, yada. And I, I really believe that. Um, it wasn't the case. It didn't happen. And I was in her house one day, and uh, my bedroom was upstairs. And I went up this, they had a little flight of steps. We took like six or seven steps, and there's a landing, and the you know the staircase changed it away. And I stopped at the staircase, and it was just there. To me, it was just normal because it, it's been mm. going on for a while. Sucking air, she looks at me, and uh, she's about ten years older than I am. Uh, she's almost eighty at the time. She looked at me. She says, "Boy," she says, "You got to go see a doctor." She said, "There's something wrong with you." And she says. You know, she said, your father died of a heart attack. And I remember my response was, I looked at her and said, well, so did yours. Just <laughs> 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 being defensive. And so when I came back to Colorado, I I did. I, you know, went in the, to see a, uh, I saw my GP mm -hmm. and told her what was going on. And they sent me to a cardiologist. And at first they sent me to pulmonary specialists. Mm -hmm. Until they found out, they did a uh, angioplasty, and angioplasties are, are interesting. If people who don't know what they are, it's where they stick the camera in your wrist and goes all the way up into your heart, yep. and um, they give you a propofol, which you're conscious, but I mean you don't feel anything. You're you're kind of out there, and uh, right in front of the table, you're in an operating room. There's a big, I don't know, thirty some inch television screen and of course i don't know i think that's more for them but i mean it had to be there it's like well you know might as, might as well watch this mm -hmm. and i remember the cardiologist at first you know he was pretty negative he says well i don't you know you know i can hear him talking i don't think there's any logic or anything here and then all of a sudden the camera and you can just hear it's like wow and i had a complete blockage in one of my my left ventricles. no way and so when they put the stint in, I, I again mistakenly thought, wow, I'm going to have energy. I'm going to have this. And nope. no. 
<laughs> so it, it is what it is. I mean, I'm I'm just glad that they caught that. Yeah. And that uh, I can still do things. I, I would imagine, though, that if you know after doing, let's say, you know, seven or eight forms or, or you know, whatever certain sets of things, if you know there's a point where you're going to have to stop, does that make you more thoughtful about what and how you train? I'm pretty dense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, well, I mean, that's just the way I'm, I, I, sure. I, I consider myself a doer, so I, I want to yeah. I want to go. Uh, I want to be like you. You know, I want to go with the class and I don't want to be in person, you know. Uh, Gosh, I mean, I I was definitely the oldest person in the class, but I I never, I don't think of that. So it's, to me, it's frustrating. And it's still frustrating. I had a class last night and knock on wood, it was an hour and a half and um, I did pretty well. There was just three of us, and uh, so I get to rest a lot because it's like, well, you do yours, and then someone does, you know, and we switch off doing colors while we watch each other. But uh, that helps. But I still hit that wall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, I'll I'll be able to continue to to do it. I have been to the cardiologist a couple times in the last month, and they're thinking I have another blockage. Oh, okay. to um, do another one of those angioplasties. And actually, they were supposed to call me a couple of weeks ago. And for some reason, they spaced it out. And I'm so dumb. It's like, well, I'm not going to call you and volunteer for it either. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, my, I, you know, I've got a good attitude about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it sounds it. it. It sounds like you're you're training because you love to train and everything oh, else is secondary. I, I want to leave this world healthy. Mm. I just do. I mean, again, I, I live in Colorado. I, uh, I play uh, disc golf. I just had to, I bought an e-bike because I, I biked been pretty much all my life. Mm-hmm. And I got to where, of course, I, couldn't ride the bike. You know, everything up here is about there's, there's nothing. Flat. Well, that, that's what I'm thinking. The, yeah. the way you're talking about riding a bike, I'm thinking, I don't know that I'm riding a bike at 9,000 feet. Yeah, there's, there's 7,000 feet. There's nothing flat around here. And so when I go for my bike ride with my regular bike, I would always have to, because I live on top of a hill, mm. I have to walk the bike home. I, yeah. you know, there, there used to be this one area before I hit the hill. Oh, it's about two, three hundred yards, and there's a telephone pole. I'd always, I'd be riding my bike. And say, well, I want to make it to that telephone pole, or I want to make it just ten feet past it. But I've always, I don't think I've ever made it to the top of the hill. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I actually had a uh, a neighbor uh, make fun of me one time. You know, said, "Well, geez, you know, my wife can do that." Well, you know, good for her. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I ended up buying an e-bike. Mm. And boy, that just opened up. I mean, that that kind of opened up a door that was just brought me so much joy. Oh, that's great! I, was, I did a thousand miles a year on that. Wow! For the four years I had it, okay. but uh, in the last two years, I had broken my ribs twice, and that's I think because I got a head injury and it's just a mm. balance thing. So oh, I broke okay. my ribs the last time I broke three of them. Um, right at the end of my driveway, I was going to go for a 27 mile ride because that's about that's about when the battery would run out or, or start to. And you don't want to, at least me. I mean, I can't ride a regular bicycle that long. It uh, an e-bike with a they're uh, even heavier with a ten yeah with a 10 pound battery. <laughs> but uh, I went to the I got to the end of my driveway and I took a left. I had in my backpack. I had a sandwich and fruit, and I mean, I, you know. 27 miles would take me about three, three and a half hours because I would stop quite often. Yeah. Not so much because I was wiped out. It's just, it's so beautiful. And, Why not enjoy it? Absolutely. And um, I got to the end of my driveway, and as soon as I took a left, I, I looked at the sun and I realized, oh, you know, I forgot my sunglasses. Wasn't upset. It was like, you know, forgot my sunglasses. And I just took a left hand turn and 
gosh, I mean, if, if it had been different within three, four minutes, I would have been on my journey. Mm. And I crashed and burned, and I broke mm. three ribs. I think that was May 19th. And that's the fifth time I've broken ribs. And by God, at my age, you just don't heal like you did when you were young. <laughs> that really, really hurt. And yeah. it took my spring and early summer absolutely away from me. Yeah. It just did. So it stinks. Yeah. So I, you know, I ended up selling the bike. Mm. And I had regrets, but I'm also proud of myself because had that happened 20 years ago, Eagle would not have let me sell that bike. Mm. So I, it, it, it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> did you did you fight the stubbornness and, and train differently? I mean, broken, broken. Anybody, I suspect a lot of people listening to this show have broken ribs before. There's really not much you can do, but just try to take it easy. Yeah. And again, uh, when I was young, I think the first time I broke my ribs was at a, uh, a tournament in Spokane, Washington. And gosh, I remember, you know, they had to stop the math, of course. But I, you know, sat there and watched. And I remember walking around. And I'm sore because they've always, I've always learned it. Bruised ribs hurt as much as broke and mm. just denial. And it was several hours later before I ended up going to the emergency room. And uh, I'll never forget the doctor coming out and he had an x ray in one hand and a needle in the other. And he says, You broke three ribs, you got two floaters. Mm. Then you've heard. And uh, one of the hardest parts about, because I don't remember a whole lot about that, but I remember. One of the hardest parts is it's a long drive from Spokane, Washington, back to Missoula, Montana. Yeah. <laughs> you really feel the bumps in the road. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, those those kind of ribs, after five or six weeks, uh, I was pretty much doing, you know, doing things. Mm. You know, they were sore, but they weren't, uh, they didn't stop me. This last time here in May, it stopped me. Mm-hmm. So it's like I'm not willing to go through that. I'm just, I'm just not. <laughs> yeah. We were talking before we got rolling that you got back into martial arts, which of course means that there was a point where you got out of martial arts. And I'm curious if you wouldn't talk about that. That step away. Um, the step away. Uh, I'm not proud of it but i'm not ashamed of it because i got very very heavy into drugs and alcohol Mm -hmm. i was uh yeah i was kind of a mess (laughs) and that was you know quite a few years and when i got sober it was just one day i just decided I, i remember just thinking like there's only two ways this is going to end. This is especially with the drugs, because I was in a, you know, some, some, I mean, this is this is a non-pot thing. Yeah. Um, I just remember thinking that there's only two ways this is going to end, and that's going to be jail or I'm going to die. And I gave up the drugs, I gave up alcohol, and I gave up smoking cigarettes. Pretty much back back not all at the same time because each one individually was a bitch <laughs> yeah um and then afterwards i had to think you know i had to replace that because when i got drunk i was a social butterfly i mean mm. i I'd, I'd wake up in the mornings and had 10 15 new best friends <laughs> And I yep. and I so I had done that lifestyle for 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 more years than I like to think about. Mm. And uh, so I you know got my life straightened out. Um, met a really nice spouse. We were together for fourteen years. Um, and sadly, she committed suicide. Mm. And so I spent a. Uh, Oh, I guess about a year on what I call a pity pot. Um, and th- th- the same little light bulb in my head went off. It's like, well, you know, this this sucks. 
there's mm. nobody doing this to me. I'm, you know, I'm doing this to me. It's, it's a, it's a choice. It's not a super conscious choice, but, but not a good one. And I can remember thinking, and, and the words were, what used to bring you joy? Mm. And what used to bring me joy was karate. Mm. And uh, so I, you know, look, I, I was aware, of, you know, because I've always had a net, just, I would still go to tournaments around here, you know, but uh, then I, I joined, I joined a, uh, a dojo and it was funny because, gosh, the first six months, maybe even longer, uh, I would be the one out, out by a side door, literally on my knees, just <laughs> sucking air. I was so out of shape and it just, it took more than weeks. It took months mm. to get back into it. But, I can see improvement and see improvement and, uh, you know, and stayed until the sensei, you know, called me out. And of course he was being very kind and it was the right decision. You know, my stubbornness is the one that I would have, I would have gone there and bowed out four or five times, sucked there and gone back in. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of how that happened. Mm -hmm. I had to get, I had to get out of self and, yeah. and uh, that was a healthy, mentally and physically way to 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 do so i want to i want to talk about a little bit in that in that year for a moment because you're you're talking about one of the most tragic things that a person Absolutely. can experience yeah and you had a history of applying some less than ideal coping mechanisms oh and you didn't go there well, you didn't been... relapse, but from yeah. what I understand of talking to folks who um, are in recovery, that that voice never goes away. That temptation is never fully gone. Oh, never. Um... And, and so there's something interesting in there for me where you chose not to do that when, let's face it, there are probably very few people in the world who would have judged you harshly. For relapsing at that moment and instead went to something else that you used to do to do being karate well i think that's basically because i know myself and this and i had gone through this once before you know where, where things just got overwhelmed so mm -hmm. i you know i i definitely 100 percent seriously thought about it my uh my drug of choice was was coke and I didn't do coke, but you know, by the gram. I mean, I I would, you know, I was also a supplier, so mm -hmm. I had coke by the ounces. And uh, I remember my thoughts were, well, if I drink, I'll do coke, and if I do coke, I'll do I'll drink, mm -hmm. and that's what would go in my head, and. It was like, you know, we just go to, well, that sucks because that goes to, I will be in jail or I will be dead. There was no third choice on that. And that's, that's what got me out of it. I, you know, especially after the suicide, I definitely, you know, I, I definitely struggled with that. But, you know, what was that going to serve? You know, that, that might have worked for, a day, a few hours. <laughs> I'm not sure because I didn't do it, but mm. I, I for sure went there. And mm. knock on wood, I mean, I, I didn't. And I think you know, martial arts plays a lot in that as far as just having that kind of a, a mindset. Because I've always been a health nut. Again, I had mentioned earlier that my father you know, he had me on tennis courts when I was old enough to drag a racket, not even be able to pick a racket. <laughs> and I didn't have a choice. I had to play tennis. Uh, when I was with my father, because uh, my parents were divorced, um, seven days a week at three o'clock in the afternoon every day, because that was his thing. Mm. And uh, uh, I did it. I enjoyed it. But then there was, of course, there was times that, especially when you're a young teenager, I want to do other things. Right. I want to have to be home at three o'clock and play tennis with my dad. Right. And uh, I remember my biggest goal when I was young is I want to beat this guy. And that didn't happen until 
God, that was maybe 13 years old or so. I mean, where I was good enough because dad was good. I mean, you know, dad had played for 70 some years. But that's still pretty young. Well, I, 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 I got good. I mean, that tennis yeah, that sounds camp good. I went to in Vermont was a tennis camp. So again, they drilled that into you too. So, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I was in what they called it back then, the U.S. Uh, LTA, the United States Lawn Tennis Association. It's now called the USTA. I was in, in that program. I played tournaments all over. So I was a hot shot. So I thought I was a hot shot. That reminds me one time again when I was young, I'm down in Florida and I was on a public court. I was just practicing. And um, this old, old guy, old guy, that's what I am now, an old person. But anyway, 75 years old, he came over and asked me if I uh, wanted to play. And I remember thinking, ah, oh, shoot, I don't want to play some old fart. You know, who the hell wants to, you know, but, you know, being kind, and I was brought yeah. up right. Okay, you know, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll entertain you, you know, play some tennis with you. And I used to love to rust the net, and I had a pretty good serve. Hmm. This guy destroyed me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely destroyed me and hardly moved. I mean, he had to take a step, you know, I'm running around, rushing the net, and he's lobbing him. And I remember afterwards, it's like, you know, what, what what just happened? Who are you? He says, well, he was the Florida 75 and under state champion. Yeah. And he knew, he knew where the ball was going. He had oh, a, experience a, over it. Yeah. What a humbly great experience that was. Oh. I'll never forget that. He just, yeah, he played me like a little puppet. <laughs> and you need humbling. We do. Yeah, I do anyway. I I, oh, I do too. Yeah, several times in my life. <laughs> wow. Was was there anything that flowed back and forth from tennis to to karate for you? Did you see them as distinctly separate, or was there overlap? I think separate. Um, you know, the tennis again. I was more or less. I don't like to badmouth my father, but I mean, if he would have encouraged me more than instead of forcing me, mm-hmm. I would have got so much more out of it. I would have had, you know, the resentments I had, and I think I would have been a much better player. Also, mm-hmm. um, I was born interesting enough. Um, you know who Josh Simmers is? I've heard the name. Oak, the Oakland Now and Friday podcast. Oh, okay, yeah. You've had him on your show. No. Yeah, you did. We did? I think you did. I'm pretty sure you did. All right. This this is where you... This is where having this many episodes, sometimes my mind fails me. Almost positive you did. Okay. Well, I'll... We, we can anyway. Yeah. Um, I had discovered him. This is after I started listening to y'all. Y'all, I love that. Um... I discovered that because I've always been fascinated with, you know, with Okinawa. I still am, as a matter of fact. Um, and I uh, heard a couple of his podcasts, and he would just kind of mention, well, I'm from a small town. And then he, one time he mentioned something like, uh, I'm from a small town in Pennsylvania that nobody's ever, ever heard of. And I remember thinking, geez, I just wonder, you know, because I was born in Pennsylvania. I was actually born in my house. Uh, in, in, in my bedroom, because uh, again, my father was a doctor, and um, we didn't have a hospital in the whole county. And anyway, the little, little town that I was born and raised in was called Tumkanic. It means where the rivers meet. Mm. And uh, and it turned out that you know on one of his podcasts, he had mentioned that. I was like, wow, what's the chances of that? Yeah. And so I exchanged an email with him just to introduce myself. And of course, I think there's probably a 30 year difference between us. But when I grew up in Tunkhannock, Pennsylvania, there was one red light in the whole county. And you're talking a, you know, a county. There was only one school you went to. You only went to one kid in the garden. It was, it was, it had its benefits. I mean, the, the closeness was amazing. 
ever since I was very, very small, all I dreamed about, thought about was going out and seeing the world. I couldn't wait until I was 18 to leave home. And it's it, it just baffles me that that's not the way kids think nowadays. And uh, and I did. I mean, I mm. I I moved to Montana, uh, lived there for you know many many years. Lived there until uh, there was a recession, and I mean, you couldn't get a job shining shoes. Mm. And uh, I owned a house. I bought a house in Montana. I actually went down to a um, like an office supply store in Missoula and gave that house away. I put it for sale, but of course there was a recession. And so a friend of mine uh, had a wife and a couple of kids. It's like, have a house. <laughs> mm. Wow. Well, and, why? I, I take it you were leaving Missoula. Well, because I knew I went I went to Florida because oh. that's where my mom had lived, and that's where mom and dad would exchange us. There was five of us in the family. And so I was comfortable there. And you can always work in Florida. Mm. I mean, you know, a thousand people a month, I think, moved to Florida and always have. Yeah. So it was always building. And, and that's what I did. So I went to Florida and I regrouped. Mm. So I you know, got back on my feet. And of course, my dream was as soon as I, as soon as things get better, I'm out of here. I mean, mm. I, you know, I'm, I'm done with the East Coast. How long did you stay? Three years. Yeah. Three years, and I took uh, I took uh, two styles down there. I took uh, Goju, mm -hmm. and I took Waiki Ru. Now Waiki Ru is a very very strange style. It, it is different. It and uh, for for folks listening, it, I suspect you all either know what Waiki Ru is, or you've never heard of it. it. It's it is it has pockets, and there's actually a pocket in New England where it's very strong. Oh, so yeah? I'm familiar with it because of that. Yeah. Well, I took it from a, uh, a guy named Rick Martin, and Rick is, he actually uh, went to Japan and was the first American to win an all-championship there. Mm -hmm. I went there to his original dojo. He had his mentor from Japan who couldn't speak. He couldn't even say hello in English. And I remember walking in there, introduced myself, and the guy took a baseball bat and started smacking himself on the shed, full force, and they're standing there saying, this guy's freaking nuts. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, and that's, that was kind of my introduction. It's like, and you're thinking, what have I got myself into? What have I got myself into? And of course, you know, what you rule was about its body conditioning. Mm. I mean, they, they still smack each other with sticks and things in the billy. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I took that and Wakey really originally didn't have any katas, and then they had one or two, but the system didn't have katas when it originated. Mm, per se. I didn't know that. Um, so I, I stuck with, for, with, with him for almost two years, and then I went to a, a Guzhu place, and then I got out of Florida. And that's when I moved to uh, I moved here to Colorado. But yeah, I'll never forget that guy with the baseball bats going like, and that is supposed to make me want to just like, here, sign me up. Well, I did. So we're <laughs> <laughs> well, well, because you you started training in the 60s when maybe that was nuts, but it was it was part of the culture. I was like, I've always prided myself that if you can play the piano and I wanted to, so can I. And I think that came the only president I ever had an interest in was John F. Kennedy. And Kennedy encouraged that kind of thinking, that you can mm. do anything. And I still think that way. Now, I might not get much past chopsticks, but if I want to play the piano, I can play the piano. Mm. If I want to learn how to you know, play a trumpet or anything else, if I, if I want to do it, I can do this. And that has served me very well in my life. Mm. Very, very well. One of the common threads, you, you listen to the show, so you know this, when we have people on who their career isn't martial arts, that they didn't train and then go off and find some way of making money with martial arts, that they have, let's say, a more conventional job or even an unconventional job. 
almost all of them will say that martial arts provided a toolkit that they could draw from for that. So when you talk about trying these new things, being able to do anything you set your mind to, how much of that comes from your time as a martial artist? I think the majority of it mm. you know, is, is that can-do attitude. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I, I believe in that saying that winners never quit and quitters never win. And that has served me very well for the most part. Mm. It, it just has, and I still have that attitude. Mm. And um, I don't think I've mentioned, I've had five back surgeries. And, no, we haven't talked about that. That's in yeah, the notes. I had five back surgeries. I had my, you know, this is one of my, I think that's what really started my adventure <laughs> into drugs and alcohol were really intensified because back surgeries, first of all, every one of mine anyway, takes a minimum of six months to mm. recover. When I say six months, I mean, you're, you're, you're not driving, you're not, I mean, I can remember in the house here going outside with a walker and walking maybe 15, 20 feet, and that's it. Yep. The next day, I'd say, well, I can go, you know, five steps more. Then I'd, I'd aim for the corner. But, I mean, it takes an awful long time to come back. Hmm. Um, I've had three sets of rods in my back. I currently have four rods. I have two that go up either side of my spine for my T's, which is up between the shoulders, all the way down to my hips. And then I got two that kind of go at a 45 degree angle from about L4 or 5 uh, into your hips, mm. which is amazing surgery when you think about it. And uh, my attitude then, of course, was, well, it sure beats being on a cart holding a holding the cup out on sure. <laughs> the donations. Um, but my first back surgery, gosh, I was in the hospital. I didn't leave the hospital for two and a half, three months. I mean, it was just, it sucked. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I can think of other words to use, but none of them are, are as appropriate. Uh, and, you know, for, and it, for this it don't have the attitude that you know, again, my job was to get better. Hmm. That's what my job, that's what my, and that's, that was what I wanted to do, of course. But what a slow recovery. And then my second back surgery was after uh, a couple of months after being out of the hospital. Then I was good enough to where he wanted me to go, you know, you, you do physical therapy. Mm -hmm. And I went to physical therapy for about, I don't know, maybe about a month. And all I would do was the bands, uh, lay on the mat, just really simple for, for people who haven't had that, very, very simple, mundane yeah. things. And the very first day, the physical therapist, he said, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to ride a stationary bike. It's like, okay. Walked me over and I got on the stationary bike and I'm, you know, going around and around with the pedals and when i got done it was only i don't know five minutes or so but i remember when i got off the bike he was taking me back over to the mats another thing that we did was were, were pool exercises that takes pressure mm -hmm. off sure um, anyway after i got off the bike i remember i kind of turned around and i looked i said you know i said that just hurt me and i had herniated two more discs and the very next day i was back in oh that's when I had my back, my second back surgery. But yeah, it's like that just hurt me. <laughs> so right now I've got, let's see, I've got four rods. I got a metal plate up in my T's, and I've got five fusions. And fusions are where the, either you had a choice. Of course, I didn't have a choice. The doctors sure. uh, they sometimes take fusions. They take bones from cadavers. Mm -hmm. um, for me, they took they take it off your hip. Yeah, and um, all I can say is that if, if if you ever watch a back surgery on YouTube, you'd be darn glad you're not conscious. 
I mean, they just literally bend you over a sheepskin. And uh, I mean, I've got a scar from my shoulder blades all the way down to my sacrius. I would imagine you'd have more than one scar. Well, no, I, no. after five of them, I, I remember going to a surgeon because I went to the same place. Uh, three, okay. three were the same surgeon and he retired, you know, and one of his partners did another. I remember saying, why don't you just put some Velcro on this? <laughs> you know, I mean, God, you're, you're cutting me open, you're opening me up, and you're doing all this stuff. And, yeah. uh, but I am so thankful, so grateful, because here I am, busy and whining, <laughs> and still doing things. Not like other people, but I was never like other people. <laughs> but, but doing but, what you can, doing, make, oh, uh, making the best of what you have. I'm just, I'm just delighted because the other side of the coin is horrible. I, that's, yeah, when I mentioned earlier that, you know, I, about the drinking and the drug, and I mean, uh, I wasn't able to fight that. And I was, I was, you know, I wasn't innocent to that, but I mean, that's what really got me into, you know, after, mm. after five of these things, I mean, again, it takes months to recuperate from these things. You don't yeah. You don't get out of the hospital and say, okay, I'm ready to go play tennis. No. Right. You know, I'm using walkers and walkers to canes. And, uh, it's, I mean, having to have people bathe you, it's, it's very, very humbling. Very, 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 very humbling. Mm. <laughs> I, I, I'm thankful I haven't been there. But I'm also wondering, you know, was there, you, you, you used the word humbled, you know, that it was good for you to be humbled at various points in your life. Would that be one of them? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I've got a big ego. Mm. <laughs> and I think um, a lot of that is just, it's just the way I'm put together. Mm. But of course, again, at tennis, I mean, I'm going to Vermont to a tennis camp. I'm playing tournaments over at Dartmouth College and stuff, and I'm going to New York. So I'm going all over playing these tournaments. I was, you know, at, at that level, I was, and I still am. I was always my worst enemy. Mm -hmm. I was, I was a jerk in tennis before John McEnroe, or there was a tennis player before McEnroe. His name was Ily Nastasi, uh, who also had. Uh, matter of fact, he made John McEnroe look like a like an angel on the tennis. <laughs> uh, that was me. I was my own worst enemy. If I would double fault once or twice, I used to break more tennis rackets than I wish. I wish I had some of the tennis rackets. I used to, and in front of crowds, I just after a couple of double faults, I'd find a, a pole, wrap around the pole, and storm off, storm off the court. And uh, I think the last racket I, I ever broke, I had an older brother. He was nine years older than me, and he was a tennis instructor at this camp. And he had gone away for the weekend on a, overnight with, with his cabin. Mm -hmm. He let me borrow his tennis racket. I'll never forget. It was called a Tad and Davis Silver Streak. Beautiful. And I used to play with Tad and Davis rackets, but I didn't have a silver streak. This was a beautiful racket. And he let me borrow it for the tournament. And I wrapped it around a pole, which is what I did back in those days. And when he got back from his camping trip, I think I hid for two days. Everybody, of course, knew that I had done it. It was like, I can't face my own brother. He's going to put that racket where I don't want it. But <laughs> <laughs> mm. I think, you know, that, I think that fed the eagle, you know, somewhat. But uh, yeah, I, I I I like to be humbled. I I, I think it's just a good lesson. Mm. <laughs> Puts you in your place, right. like playing the old guy on the tennis court that destroyed me. You know, here I am, years and years. Good God, that was sixty years ago, and mm. I still remember that. It's like, wow, that guy destroyed me. <laughs> So, audience, just in case uh, something feels abrupt here, uh, I lost internet, and so we had I had to deal with that. But we're back. <laughs> when you think about your time as a karateka, as a martial artist, you know, 
inevitably, most of us are going to think historically, but we're also going to think, what am I doing now? What do I want to do? Right? We kind of think of this, this ongoing process of this, for most of us, very strong thread throughout our lives. What are you thinking about for the future? Are there you you when you talked about the different styles you've trained in, you've spoken very positively of that. It sounds like you've enjoyed experimenting, trying new things within the martial arts. Is that something that's that you're looking at, uh, or are there other things that maybe excite you about tomorrow? Well, all kinds of things excite me. I I, I love embracing new things. Mm. Um, you know, when I lose something like the bicycle riding or different things because of injuries and health problems, I always replace them with something. Mm. I mean, uh, I, at least I always have, knock on wood. Um, I've always entertained the thought that I would like to work with kids for free. Not a whole bunch. I'd like to have maybe two or three um you know, serious kids who really want to learn. But mm. I am scared to death of, of COVID. Yeah. And all I think about is, uh, when I think about that, it just, that just brings me joy. There's a uh, site here, I, and maybe it's it, maybe it's all of the United States. I'm not that computer literate. It's called The Neighborhood. And it's just these little mountain communities. Like I live in a place mm. called Kittreds. Only a couple hundred people here. Uh, yeah. No red lights, no government. We have a, a general store and, and everybody has to go to the post office. There's no mail delivery up here in the mountains. Mm. As a matter of fact, the nearest grocery store is a couple towns over. <laughs> mm. um, and I love it. But um, so anyway, there's a, 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 a website. I only learned about it uh, about two years ago called The Neighborhood. And it's just these mm -hmm. mountain communities. And people use it to complain, to sell things. To brag, to pitch, uh, like right now, it's a magical time of the year. It's the right in the middle of the uh, of uh, the mating season for elk, mm. and uh, they're bugling. I mean, you can't. I go outside, and within five minutes, you're going to hear one bugle. And I can stand here at my house and say, "Well, that's down at the park, or that's over here." You can mm. just tell by the echo. And I can't describe, and, and most people don't know what they'll be able to sounds like, but it, to me, it's magic. Mm. And so, you know, I got off on a tangent here. Well, bring me back, Jerry. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> well, we, we have... Um, we have one here in Vermont called Front Porch Forum. I know other areas of the country have one called Next Door. Uh, they, they're, they're around, and yes, there's a lot of complaining on there. But I, you were talking about the idea of teaching children, and I wonder, were you thinking um, about? Yeah, I think next door is the name of that thing here. Uh, okay. Anyway, um, all I think about is like when I worked with the kids at school, um, I always got two colds, at least two, and I hate colds. I I've always, I think it's, I think I'm joking, but I've always said that I'd rather fracture a bone. I would definitely take sutures over having to deal with a cold because mm. it's just five days of your life that I don't have the time for and you can't do anything about it. And that was just part of the kids. I mean, at the start of the class was always three quarters of them. I'd get on my knees and I'd have to put their belt on and tie their belt. Mm. Um, some of them, you know, you even had to tie, you know, tie the gi. Um, and then, you know, the kids, they don't think anything of having a runny nose and right. well, our, our shoe right. and not turning their heads. I mean, of course I got sick. And that's what, <laughs> besides me, well, being afraid of COVID and having heart disease puts me in that high risk thing. Yeah. Um, but you could do something over Zoom. I don't know. Yeah, again, with little kids, I don't know. It, not, with, not, with the, not with the little ones, no. Yeah. Well, I'm doing stuff with myself with Zoom and that's, you know, and that's enough for now. But, uh, you know, that's just one of those things that I think would just, it would be enjoyable. And, and who knows, mm. you know, I, 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 it's, it's still in the noggin. <laughs> right on, right on. Do you have a favorite kata? Uh, I've always been intrigued because the first time I ever saw it, uh, the Hachi. Mm. Um, I've always been intrigued with it. 
because it looks so simple. I remember the first time my, my sensei did it, and you know, he showed the class, and I was like, I said, I says, I'm gonna learn that how to. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna skip uh, Kushanku and everything else. Just, I, I just thought that was a cool little kata. Yeah. And then I had read because I, I'm a, I, I love to read. Mm -hmm. I had read that they used to teach that to school kids in Japan, and that just put it in my mind. Well, the simplicity, not simple. <laughs> no. I, I once heard a friend, and I'm, I, I would quote him, but I think I'm gonna butcher it a little bit say that everything he ever needed from a kata he found in the hanshin or you know to, to folks who may not recognize that name techie right that'd be the, the shoulder conversion i guess yeah um there's a lot in there i like how people, if you look uh refer to it so uh, i've heard it referred to it like you're on a cliff mm. and right behind you you know that's your death so mm. you, know, you have to fight. Uh, the one I really enjoy is uh, you're in an elevator. You're in a small elevator because you're not moving. And of course, I would always be turning my said, no, you, you, you keep the stance and you're in close quarters. But I love that kind of for some reason. It took me the, the hardest one for me to learn. Um, not the hardest, but it took the longest because it's not really hard. Uh, it was a uh, Kushanku. Just because of all the stupid moves and uh, doing it with a uh, a little bit of a brain injury is really silly. I, I, I can laugh at myself, but I mean, I just, some days I can go through it. And other times it's like, I'll, I'll get through it. Just, I'll look at uh, the, my, uh, the person who's been training me and says, I forgot two, three moves. In. And I said, yeah, you forgot. Quite a few. It's a long form, and there's a lot of interesting directional changes. It uh, it was my competition form for many many years. It's, it's, it's one that I really enjoy. It's, it's one of the most popular. You know, mm. we have three big tournaments out here in Colorado, huh. and uh, I always have gone to them. I mean, I've been here almost forty years now. Um, one of them we they didn't have them two years ago when COVID was here. They didn't have any of the tournaments. And they only had one of them last year, and it's called the Friendship Cup. Mm -hmm. And I remember I used to go, I, I've actually competed in the Friendship Cup a couple of times before I stopped competing. Um, there'd be 500 people. I mean, people mm -hmm. come from Texas, come, come all over. And of course, as years go by, that got less and less. But uh, I went to the Friendship Cup, and I only went there for about an hour, or hour and a half, and I never. It's at a college, so it's in their auditorium. And I never did get the seats. I stood up in the back and like in a balcony and I watched it because again, I'm 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 scared of this of this COVID thing. Uh, you know, because of the heart things and, and it's mm -hmm. it just it is what it is. But I went for that. And then my one of my favorite ones is the one that a, a sensei out here's name is Sensei Garabani has, and that's a Wadokai. Uh, tournament and people from Japan come over for that. But after the Friendship Cup, the Friendship Cup, they're both in April. Friendship Cup was always first, and within two mm -hmm. weeks is this other one. And uh, they just decided, no, if it was second year, they're not going to have that. Mm -hmm. And sadly, one of my very, very best friends, um, Sensei Garibani, is now about 81 years old. One of my very, gosh, I, I love him dearly. Um, uh, I have celebrated my last 11 or 12 birthdays with, with this man and his mm -hmm. wife. Um, I, I do Thanksgiving and Christmas. We exchange. He uh, sadly, in, in January, he took a group of students from this dojo, went to a big tournament down in Las Vegas, and mm -hmm. came back. And uh, two weeks later, he died of COVID. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And. Uh, yeah, yeah, that uh, that 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 just disturbed me. <laughs> because he was so healthy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, his name, name was Adrian, and Adrian was a was a fifth down. Mm. Um, just the nicest guy in the whole world. Matter of fact, it's funny. His wife had offered, you know, like, what would you like for memorabilia? 
and mm. uh, I had one of those belts mm. you know, sitting right up over. That's a that's a huge honor uh, on a wall. And, um, yeah, uh, I I missed that, especially at uh, uh, my birthday was in July, uh, mm -hmm. so especially you know July it hit me, and of course Thanksgiving coming up because yeah. last Thanksgiving. Um, about a week before, or two weeks before, we went to uh, an Outback State House, big house. And usually, he and his wife and I would have dinners at least once a month, year round. Mm -hmm. We always went to uh, the same Mexican restaurant. It's called Jose Shays, and um, and it was always you know the three of us, sometimes the four, because his wife has a twin sister, but. Uh, once every few months, it would just be Adrian and I. And mm. thank goodness, about a, uh, a couple weeks before uh, Thanksgiving, Adrian and I ended up going to this, uh, and I've got a picture of that. And so, I, mm. and I treasure that because, again, super, super close. Never trained with the guy. My son mm. was Adrian's best friend that they grew up together at the Cincy Garibaldi's dojo when they were young teenagers. And they mm. would go to Japan, and I mean, I mean, yeah, this is this was serious stuff, and yeah. but for some reason, Adi and I just hit it off, and uh, yeah, for, for for many 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 years, exchanged Christmas presents before. Those martial arts friendships are something that you know it, it certainly happens outside of the martial arts, but I think the best friendships really do come from some manner of common ground, and when when you grow up, maybe not with someone but knowing that they had another element of their upbringing that made them who they are like martial arts there are you get to skip a few steps wow. in a friendship and, and it creates such a strong bond the, I get the it. dedication I get it. that it takes mm. i mean again there's a very high dropout rate i mean who you know what what quote normal person wants a son yeah I'm, Probably going to get a bloody nose if I stay for a few years. There's a good chance I'm going to break something, or, yeah. or, or you know, you're going to wish you did. Um, but like you said, it builds. I mean, gosh, when I think about the half a dozen or so close people in my life right now today, they're all karate people, yeah. and a few of them. A lady I went out and had dinner with uh, on, on a Saturday is one of the parents of. Of the kids in in the schools, it was yeah. funny. Uh, at Christmas time, uh, I'd get more Christmas gifts than a sensei would, because I was the one that was always teaching the kids. Once once you found out I can handle it, it was like, yeah, I I I might be late, and being late came to I wouldn't see them. Right. <laughs> you know, I took the class, and I loved it. I just I absolutely loved it. I can tell. Mm. <laughs> brings brings me joy. Thank you for your stories. This is this has been great. I appreciate you coming on. And you know, you know how we end this here. It's it's your chance. What do you want to leave the audience with today? I'd like to leave the audience. My main message would be is don't let any if you really enjoy, whether it be karate or anything else, don't let age or injury stop you from doing it. You may not be able to do it at the level you left because of an injury or an illness, but you can still do it. I mean, I could probably still hit a tennis ball. I can't run for it. I'm not going to dive for it. I'm not going to rush the net, but I can swing a racket. You know, I don't, but, um, you know, I took up, uh, uh, disc golf. I don't know if anybody, many people know what that is, but we played with a frisbee. And I took that up because a, a gal, gosh, she's only about 14 years old, took me out to play one day. And I think the second or third hole, I looked at this, you know, the, the, uh, the disc that they use is much smaller than the regular frisbee. I remember mm -hmm. looking at her and says, where do you buy these things? And I was playing disc golf two, three times. I mean, I, I just loved it until I mm. started throwing my shoulder out and stuff. And I still play it. Um, yeah, don't let, you know, I, you know and I take the lesson, I take that lesson from the back surgeries. You know, I had choices. I can sit around and feel sorry for myself. Well, you know, I can't do this anymore. 
But you can say, well, what can I do? Hmm. And that's gotten me a long way in life. I think that would be my message, is you can, you can always do something. It's no secret, I think, martial arts is an option in almost every situation. You can apply an element of martial arts training to most problems. Today's episode, though, illustrates how powerful, how effective those tools can be. And I was honored that Maddie was willing to be so open, so vulnerable about these things that she's experienced. I hope you out there, you listeners, recognize that. Not everybody's willing to go this deep and it means a lot when they will. Maddie, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for everything. I appreciate it. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Sign up for the newsletter. If you want, you can throw us a couple bucks. There's a PayPal donation button over there. And, you know, every single episode we've ever done. There are other ways you can support us if that's of interest. Sharing episodes, leaving reviews, telling friends, contributing to the Patreon, and more. Hey, you know, I'd love to come to your school and teach a seminar. Is that of interest to you? Let me know. We'll figure out what we can do. You've got the code PODCAST15 to buy stuff. Don't forget that. And if you have feedback, guest suggestions, topic suggestions, other stuff, let me know. Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. Our social media, it's at Whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.